So welcome everyone to the latest installment of a podcast series we've put together that focus on, focuses on state and local tax issues, specifically for technology companies. My name is Rob Schwarzman. I'm a tax partner with Cherry Beckard's Technology Group, and I'm joined today by Kathy Stanton, who leads our state and local tax practice, and Tony Kunkel, a manager in our state and local practice. Uh, Kathy, Tony, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having us, Rob. Thank you. Thanks. So as a firm, uh, we serve a large number of technology companies. And so to kick things off, I think our listeners would love to know the state tax issues you're seeing the most of that affect these companies. Yeah, and you know, what's interesting is technology companies make up probably the majority, if not majority, close to majority of our salt work. Mm -hmm. uh, you think about all of the disruptive technologies that are coming out on a continuous basis, and you look at state tax statutes that were originally written in, what, the 40s, <laughs> something like that, long before mm -hmm. computers, let alone internet, let alone all these disruptive technologies. So um, states are always behind in trying to get caught up, and they're definitely not proactive to get ahead of the curve um, or see a new technology and write guidance on how you should treat this for various state tax purposes. To the contrary, they wait till these technologies are developed even further. They kind of sit back and look to see, uh, and then they formulate their opinions. They look at what the other states are doing. And by that time, then they come in and issue assessments, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's like, then they have like three years worth to come in. So, um, but but now that we do have, you know, we, we definitely are in that information technology age, we at least have some framework that we're able to work with on the state tax side. So the three mm -hmm. the three areas that uh, that we're really seeing, and we can talk a little bit about each of these areas and, and what's happened more recently, but the three areas that that we generally see and we address in the technology space is one. Nexus. Simply, mm -hmm. do you have enough connection with a jurisdiction to be subject to its tax structure? Every state has different taxes. They can impose whatever tax structure they want. So we have a lot of nonconformity or lack of uniformity, I should say. Uh, and, and you really have to be aware of all the various state rules and how they come into play. And we deal a lot in that space. So, mm -hmm. you know, do, do we have nexus? And the second is sourcing of revenue. Uh, when you're looking at something that's happening in the cloud, it could be international. It could be, you know, you could be in a in a mm -hmm. car traveling across state lines while you're using the technology. I mean, how do you source this? For you know, various... I guess Wayfair turned sourcing and revenue on its head. You know, I guess yeah. at one point, you know, most people focused, well, if I don't have any physical presence in a state, well, I obviously don't need to file there. That is yeah. out the window. Yeah, and you know, state tax structure started with a domicile base of taxation that I generally perform work in in my physical sphere that I have around me. And so tax structures were always set up just kind of domicile based and now they're flipping to source based. Where's the revenue coming from? Where are those customers? Where is that uh, and, and we've seen significant changes in the state tax statutes, say on the income tax side for sourcing of revenue. It used to be kind of where are my services performed? Where's my intangible property? Now we're looking at where is the benefit received? Where are the users located? If you have 50 different licenses that a client buys or customer buys, where are those licenses actually being used? So absolutely, sourcing gets in, mm -hmm. into um, some nitty gritty. And, and do you have you know, 100 customers or 10 customers where you can kind of get your arms around it? Or do you have 100,000 customers where, wow, mm -hmm. we can't look at every 100,000 100, mm -hmm. contracts and determine, you know, how this stuff is sourced. So, so Nexus, um, and what I would say too, is that sourcing comes into play to determine Nexus. How do we know we have Nexus? Well, if you have a certain amount of revenue from a state in an economic Nexus theory, well, how do we know if we have a certain amount of revenue in a state? We have to determine how your revenue is sourced. So it used to be we would perform nexus reviews, and then we would go to further steps of uh, state and local tax projects. Um, now, a lot of times we have to do a sourcing review before we could even get to nexus, which is mm -hmm. very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And, and so, and Tony, I guess I'll pause there in the area of nexus and sourcing for technology companies before we get to the third new bright and shiny kind of project that we have in the state tax area for technology companies. But that nexus and sourcing, um, do you have any other thoughts or any specific clients that you can think of that, that nuances that came into play with that or any thoughts that you have additionally? <laughs> You know, I was just thinking of the idea of some states that even have these look through provisions of yeah. like, who are the customers of your customer? Yeah. Yeah. And can you look through? And right. does it? And does a state have any authority to allow you to look through or, you know, and so you try to get to the one thing that's good um, is that, you know, in order to sign a tax return, any accounting firm in order to sign a tax return, we basically have to have um, a substantial authority and a reasonable possibility of success. So a reasonable possibility of success is a one in three chance. So that means two third chance you're gonna lose, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you only need a one in three shot <laughs> in order for us as a firm to sign that tax return. Uh, but you do have to have some kind of authority, right? Whether, whether it's a statute, reg, cases, some kind of substantial authority. So now that that um, we've gone to this source-based method of distributing revenue among the states and determining whether they have nexus, um, we have a lot more gray it used to be, OK, we know where our people are sitting. We could determine revenue based on where people are sitting. But now it's like benefit received. That could be really what if we have a national we're helping a customer with a national contract is a benefit received nationally where we take a percentage of the population I, we have. But that's actually makes it more fun and it makes it more an art than a science where we can come up with positions that are much more favorable for clients, especially if there are they are say pass through entities that are owned by uh, individuals that are in no tax states, right? We might be able to get um, and lower those apportionment and actually use that kind of art gray space to lower the overall tax liability. Um, but but unfortunately, it's taking a little more work to get there. So what, what do you say to some of these early, early stage or maybe growth stage technology companies that are in a loss? A lot of times they'll come and they'll say, well, we're currently in losses. We'll worry about this when we start making revenue, when we're, st when we're profitable from a tax perspective. Yeah, that's a great point because, um, and, you know, entrepreneurs, they're trying to develop this technology. The last thing they're doing is looking for it to increase their expenses, right, to mm -hmm. pay us to file a tax return. I mean, they just don't want to hear it. Now, I completely understand that. There's no tax there. We don't want to do it. And that is absolutely an option if you have Nexus, but there's really no tax you know, you're not going to, penalties are generally based on the tax, right? So mm -hmm. it's not going to be that big of an issue. However, if there's an opportunity to establish net operating losses that you can carry forward into the future when you become profitable, mm -hmm. you don't want to miss that opportunity, especially if you have significant losses in a state mm -hmm. that can absorb future income. And to go back, um, you may be able to go back like if it's three years out and, and file those returns late to establish NOLs, but states have gotten um a little more stringent on how many years they'll allow you to file to establish NOL. So if you've been operating for quite a while and the state will only allow you three years worth to establish NOLs, then those are all those expenses that just went to waste and, and mm -hmm. you don't have NOLs to offset future income. So that sourcing of revenue is especially technology. And I think where we spend a lot of time and, and Tony, uh, feel free to chime in, but in these new technologies, we're we're thinking from a state statutory framework, you know, and frame of reference. And we have to think, OK, what is it? <laughs> what is it you're selling? And it may seem really simple on mm -hmm. the surface. Oh, we just sell software, software as a service. Well, yeah, maybe not. You know, maybe maybe for some states, this falls within like a data processing type or just a pure professional service. And so we get into, OK, what what actually are you selling? And that could that could determine or have a difference on sourcing as well. And the last area which Tony has had the pleasure and <laughs> benefit. Is that the right word? Honor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I'll take honor that. of addressing our pass-through entity elections. Mm -hmm. And this is huge. And we cannot get this information out quick enough 
fast enough. Um, it, it digest it fast enough. I digest. We can't mm -hmm. digest it fast enough because it's just flurry of legislation. But this is an opportunity for huge benefits. And and for the pass through entity elections, we're going to be where the benefits are going to lie is with these profitable, right? If you're especially if you're very profitable mm -hmm. or you're selling your technology and you have a huge amount of income on the sale of your business uh, if you're fortunate enough you know to get to that pinnacle place and mm -hmm. and cash in on all of your hard work um so a pass through entity election how this works uh, and it all started with the federal changes and with regard to an individual only being able to deduct ten thousand dollars of state income tax on their federal return the states, so if you have a C corporation versus an S corporation, if you're a C corp, hugely profitable, you can deduct all your state income taxes. And S corp, you can't, you can only deduct like $10,000 and that's a huge difference. And so the states have enacted this legislation that the IRS has given a nod to that, yes, we think this kind of works, although they have not issued regs yet, so it's not 100%, is that you can make an election to impose the state income tax at the pass-through entity level. And if it's imposed at the pass-through entity level, same tax, it's tax neutral to the states. If it's imposed at the entity level, and then when that individual files in the return, they get a credit for that tax paid at the entity level, you just converted a non-deductible expense to a deductible expense. And it's deductible for federal tax purposes. And we're talking not just a state rate of six or 7%, we're talking up to a 37% tax rate at the federal level. So it's really a federal play using state taxes. Yes, exactly. Because exactly. yeah. this infamous SALT cap that was enacted as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act starting 2018, mm -hmm. The salt cap is only imposed on individual taxpayers, but businesses don't have a salt cap for ordinary necessary business expenses. So business entities can deduct income taxes. Now, usually you're not used to deducting income taxes for passer entities because they would pass through that income to their owners. And for individuals, they would you know, report that income on their individual tax return. But through this mechanism then, by taking that deduction, the ordinary income of the past serenity becomes reduced, and therefore, as a workaround, that individual has a lower amount of ordinary income to report on their individual return. Yeah. So let me give you a scenario. We let's say you know my roommate and I started a company in our dorm room in college, and last year we sold 80% of it to a private equity group. We're still involved. We're the founders but we have a private equity group, but we, we stayed in a partnership form. So we're past serenity. Can we take advantage of this, this election? Well, you would want the partnership itself to sell the assets, right? You would want to, you would want the gain to be at the pass through. Okay. So we're level. talking about two different things. So on the sale of the assets, that's the, the or the sale of the company, we yeah, want to because, structure it as an asset sale. Because again, this is a pass-through entity election. So if you have a pass-through entity, mm -hmm. they can make an election to impose the tax at the entity level. If the owner of the partnership is just an individual and they just make a sale, they're going to be subject mm -hmm. to all the individual caps at 10000 So the gain, the income has to be within that pass-through entity itself I see. coming through on K-1 income. Okay, so then let's say in year three, after we're we're now in partnership with the private equity group, can we take advantage of the election then? Yeah, it depends on the structure, right? So it's mm -hmm. gonna. So and, and this is and Tony can can elaborate. Just saying that quite a lot. Well, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> and you know the states all and gosh, I. I just wish they would have enacted uniform legislation across all the different states. There was mm -hmm. some model legislation in the beginning. It would have been wonderful, but every state has to adopt their own statutes for what they think works best for their state. Mm -hmm. So we have different qualification requirements in all the states. We have different tax bases that are in each, each of the states. So on the surface, it seems simple, but in some states, if you have a corporate private equity, sometimes they'll have a C-Corp blocker, a C-Corp owner of the pastor entity mm -hmm. that might throw you out of qualification to be able to make mm -hmm. the election so maybe you can do some restructuring where you can get it at a upper tier pass-through entity um so there's some options on structuring maybe that can happen, but a lot of different qualification requirements that you have to be careful careful of. Um, election 
uh, dates that you have to be careful of. Uh, Tony, what are some of the other just kind of nuanced things that have come up that people just have to really be careful of? You know, the, certainly in any of the states where you've got non-residents, it could kind of change some of the filing requirements there. Um, you know, say if you had an entity that was used to just filing composite returns on behalf of all their non-resident partners, especially when there might be a large number of partners, you know, owning the entity that are non-residents, if they were used to this, you know, easier idea of just filing one composite return for everybody, they may not be able to do it the way that some states have drafted their legislation mm -hmm. they say you can make the election or file a composite return but you cannot do both uh there's a handful of states that have you know i kind of not so nice that they would do this they can say you can still file a composite return go right ahead but that credit that the owner receives for that tax paid at the entity level can't be claimed on a composite return so it's almost like a trap if you want to pay the most income tax possible <laughs> to a state double you know. tax double yeah. tax yeah. So, so yeah. What, and so if he had, in his example, if he had 200 partners and it costs a thousand dollars to prepare a tax return, that's 200,000 of expense just in preparing tax returns. And to state like California, you're subject to the past serenity tax at a 9.3 percent rate and their non-resident withholding at the 7 percent rate. And you have to wait until you file the return to get the refund back. So mm -hmm. we have all kinds of quirky mm -hmm. nuances like that. Yeah. So it sounds like they're they're. You know, if you're if you're organized as an entity with, you know, an entity as a, a member and individuals, there's opportunities, but it really depends once again on your organization structure and where you're doing business. But is there a scenario where the PTE election is a no brainer or where people see it, they should think, yes, this is something we need to do because we're organized this way or we're doing business in this place? Yeah, generally, if a pass through entity um, and its owners, like if the owners are all in one state and the majority of the apportionable income is in that same state and that state offers a pass through entity election, mm -hmm. then that's generally going to work. Right. <laughs> but the one area that can really trip people up as well is if you have owners that are in states that do not allow credits for the tax paid at the entity level, then you just double the tax. And that's going to be more than any federal deduction. Mm -hmm. um, so there are uh, some foot faults there as well. But in the simplest of structures where most of your revenue is coming from one state, the owner of the past year entity lives in that state, and that state offers the election, generally those are going to be the no-brainers. It's when you get in the multi-state mm -hmm. area, you want to make sure that you're getting all the benefit you can, and mm -hmm. most of all, that nobody's being harmed. Or we, we've seen situations where some owners can get harmed and it really benefits some other owners. So then you get in a situation, uh, you have to be careful on your partnership agreements. Who is authorized in the partnership agreement to make tax elections, or does it have to be voted on? Um, you wanna make sure that you don't just take this position without knowing that so you don't get sued, right, or the the person who made the election doesn't get sued, um, that you made this election and it harmed me, right? So um, that'd be worst case scenario, obviously. Yeah. Um, ask Tony. I'm always thinking, as a practice leader, I'm always trying to avoid getting sued is always the forefront <laughs> of my mind, right? I think it's just good life advice in general. It's yeah. good <laughs> life advice. Just avoid so I, those complications. Mm, so the takeaway <laughs> is if you're in a multi-state setting and you have a complex capital structure, it definitely be worthwhile getting some assistance before going down this path. If you have yeah. a simpler structure, maybe operating a single state or a you know, couple states, um, you know, the opportunity is a lot easier to calculate and um, maybe more beneficial to all the members uh, in the group. Yeah, and this circles actually back to nexus and sourcing. Mm -hmm. If we can source more revenue in a state that offers the election that you'd be paying state tax on anyway, mm -hmm. you just made that deductible for federal tax purposes. So now mm -hmm. we're getting in a situation that maybe we want more income in certain states, or maybe we want nexus in certain states, because if all the owners live in a taxing state, all their income is going to be taxed anyway, mm -hmm. right? But if if there is a state where um, that offers an election and it's not as beneficial in your home state, maybe you can actually capitalize by by getting more income or having nexus, creating nexus in a certain state to now make these state income taxes deductible. So it's a complete 180 kind of in the, in the thinking of planning. Interesting. Well, lots to think about here. And this is definitely the new shiny thing in state and local 
uh, tax. We appreciate your, your time today. Thank you, Kathy and Tony, for joining us and once again, sharing your insights. Um, for everyone listening, remember to subscribe to Cherry Beckard's podcast series to keep up with the latest and greatest from our industry teams and specialists. And as always, you can visit cbh.com to learn more or ask questions. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for having us, Rob. Thank Thanks. you.